0233 hours local, and in a mountain complex in North Korea just over 100 miles from the Chinese border, technicians scramble to remove camouflage netting from the entrance to a deep underground bunker. That bunker has been cut into the mountainside and covered over with camouflage to fool American spy satellites loitering hundreds of miles overhead. The cover of night helps to obfuscate the rush of activity, and the heavy cloud cover is exactly what the Hermit Kingdom was waiting for. Out of the converted mineshaft, a huge truck is carefully backed out. The massive vehicle has only one purpose, to transport the equally massive Hwasong-50 intercontinental ballistic missile. Finally eased out of its hiding hole, the truck begins the laborious process of lifting the giant missile into position. Over 40 feet tall, the missile is taller than a two-floor home and has the power to destroy several square miles of a densely packed city. The launch command officer picks up a phone hardwired straight to an underground telephone line that's connected directly to Kim Jong-un. The North Koreans have to resort to primitive telephone technology to ensure the United States or its allies aren't listening in somehow. On the other end, the North Korean dictator gives a single word. The Hwasong-15 intercontinental ballistic missile fires its main engine, shaking the entire launch complex to its core. Launch personnel hide behind blast screens or huddle inside the relative safety of the launch truck's armored cab, hunkering down in case something goes wrong and the missile and its entire fuel load explodes. Two seconds later, the missile proves to be in good operation and lifts off the ground. A thousand miles above the Earth, the United States' space-based infrared system immediately detects the thermal plume of the massive rocket. A low-Earth satellite sends an immediate flash alert to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. Brother and sister units across the broad web of U.S. missile defense and the commanders of every U.S. geographical command. A second U.S. satellite in a geostationary orbit confirms the thermal signature of a large ballistic missile and chirps a second emergency alert. The massive Hwasong-15 is nearing supersonic flight and has punched several hundred feet through the clouds and into the open sky. The U.S.'s space-based infrared system satellites have now focused their full attention on the telltale thermal signature of the big rocket. Cloud cover may have made it impossible to see liftoff with the naked eye, but the incredible heat given off by the fiery liftoff was easy to spot by infrared sensors. Now the large rocket is screaming through the air, riding a thermal plume several hundred feet long and thousands of degrees hot. The U.S. satellites immediately begin to compare the thermal signature of the North Korean rocket with a large onboard library of known missile launches. In less than a second, there's a match with two different Hwasong-15 test launches from the late 2010s. The confirmed match is immediately sent to U.S. Space Command. U.S. Space Force personnel are stunned by the multiple threat warnings from the space-based network and rush to pour through the data. Humans are far slower than machines, though, and it'll take time to verify the threat. The North Korean missile is now twice as high as a commercial airliner, and its main rocket engine is still going strong. Space Force personnel have confirmed the launch as authentic. An emergency flash is dispatched to U.S. forces in South Korea and across the Pacific. It's impossible to know where the missile is headed this early in flight. Via hotline to the DoD and the White House, the alert is out. North Korea has fired a ballistic missile, possibly tipped with a nuclear warhead. The main engine on the Hwasong-15 shuts down as it runs out of fuel. The missile coasts for a brief second, traveling at several thousand miles an hour now in the upper atmosphere, before a series of explosive bolts just under three-quarters of the way up separate the first stage of the rocket from the second stage. A second later, the second stage engine fires, and the vehicle lurches forward as it prepares to exit the Earth's atmosphere. An aide rushes to interrupt a meeting between the President of the United States of America and the leader of a partner nation. There's no time for formalities, and the President is practically dragged out of the room so he can be informed. North Korea has launched a nuclear attack. Target is still unknown. The President immediately heads for the highly restricted and secretive situation room in the heart of the White House. From there, he'll be able to communicate with American forces around the world and defend real-time tracking data from various American assets. U.S. Space Command issues an order for radar installations in South Korea and Japan to begin tracking the North Korean launch. Sea-based Spy-1 radars on American naval vessels are networked into the massive surveillance effort tracking the North Korean missile. While boosting into space, the missile is at its most vulnerable, but the United States still lacks its capability to rapidly destroy a missile during this initial phase. With development on high-velocity projectiles and directed energy weapons, it's hoped that in the near future U.S. forces will be able to down a missile during this vulnerable phase. For now, though, all U.S. assets can do is watch and gather data which will help determine where the missile is headed and which missile defense assets to activate. With a nuclear threat confirmed, the United States Secret Service begins preparations to move the president to a secure and highly classified location. If the missile is aimed at the White House, the president has less than 40 minutes to vacate. U.S. terminal high-altitude defense batteries in South Korea, Guam, and Hawaii are activated. 
Their powerful AN-TPY-2 radars begin sweeping the sky for signs of the threatening missile. Designed to obliterate an incoming ballistic missile during its terminal phase, the batteries of the interceptors are currently useless and can only defend the areas they're assigned to. Patriot missile defense batteries in the U.S. bases across the Pacific go on alert. These two are short-range defenses which are only useful for defending specific locations. U.S. Aegis-equipped warships in the region are given the same alert. Their SM-3 missiles can also be used for short-range ballistic missile intercepts just outside the atmosphere, but require the target to be in its descent stage. With a range of several hundred miles though, each Aegis-equipped ship can help protect multiple U.S. installations or naval battle groups. The U.S. Northern Command at Peterson Air Force Base begins preparations to activate the United States' homeland defenses. At Fort Greeley, Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the ground-based mid-course defense system is activated, a collection of 44 interceptors. These missiles have a far greater range than either the Mobile THAAD or the Navy's SM-3 missiles and are designed to intercept a target in the mid-course before it's had a chance to enter terminal phase and is still cruising through space. More data is needed, however, and all that U.S. forces can currently do is watch and wait. It now has become clear from the missile's trajectory that this is not an attack against forces in South Korea or Guam. Japan is also ruled out as a target. Hawaii remains a likely target, but so does the rest of the U.S. mainland. The U.S. president is notified that based on the missile's trajectory and speed, it is not a test of a new missile. All the data points to this being a legitimate launch against American forces. Given North Korean capabilities, it's likely this is an attack against either Hawaii or the American West Coast. While North Korea has missiles capable of reaching the East Coast, it's not believed they have the targeting capabilities to strike that far with any sort of precision. The president authorizes the use of ground-based interceptors against the incoming threat and order the U.S. Navy ships near Hawaii or the American West Coast to move into positions to best protect major population centers. Across the United States, a fleet of specially modified aircraft put into the air. These big planes are loaded with communications gear and hardened against electromagnetic pulses. They're known as doomsday airplanes because it's their job to ensure that the President of the United States can remain in contact with all U.S. military forces even in the event of a massive nuclear strike against the homeland. The planes will fly high enough to avoid being caught up in destruction below and provide a direct airborne link between each other and surviving space and ground stations across the world. They will not come back down until the crisis is over, with a special fleet of aerial tankers dedicated to keeping them fueled and flying. For the moment, they settle into an orbital pattern across the West Coast, the East Coast, and the American heartland. The full might of the U.S. nuclear triad is officially on alert and prepared to retaliate against any potential threat. With the possibility of another nation using the cover of a North Korean strike to attack the U.S. with its own weapons, America from this point on has to be prepared to fight a nuclear war against any adversary. Troop recall orders are issued for American units across the world, informing soldiers they must drop whatever they're doing and immediately report for duty. Nuclear-capable aircraft are prepared for a possible nuclear mission, and nuclear munitions are prepared for possible loading and launch. Deep in the darkest recesses of the world's oceans, the American nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet makes its own preparations to rain down apocalypse on the President's command. The second stage of the Hwasong-15 missile runs out of fuel. The payload detaches from the second stage and using a chemical-powered thruster adjusts its course and heading. The missile is now flying unpowered, riding the incredible momentum built by the massive two-stage rocket and moving as much as 4.2 miles a second. U.S. Space Command issues new tracking data on the North Korean missile and confirms separation of the payload from the second stage. Based on this new data, Hawaii is ruled out as a target. Current speed and elevation dictate that a hit on the southern American west coast is likely. Armed with this new data, U.S. missile defense personnel opt for a GBI launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base instead of Fort Greeley in Alaska. Four of the long, skinny missiles are activated and fed live targeting data, but they can't be launched yet. They must wait until the enemy missile draws closer before launching. The American president is rushed out of the Situation Room and two Marine One, his personal helicopter. Two attachés join the president. One carries the nuclear football, the remote nuclear command authority unit which gives the president the power to order Armageddon from anywhere in the world. The second carries a large backpack-like communications device that serves to keep the president in contact with all branches of the government and the military at all times. Rather than head to a predetermined shelter, the president opts to instead board Air Force One, believing that there's little risk to a full-blown nuclear attack on the homeland. From Air Force One, he'll be safe from the ground effects of a nuclear blast and be able to remain in contact with the rest of the military and government. U.S. and South Korean special forces stationed in South Korea and Japan are mustered and rushed to armories in preparation for a strike into the north. 
These elite units have been kept at high readiness due to recent hostilities from the north. Their specially modified Black Hawk helicopters can evade enemy radar and even fly more silently than any other helicopters in the world. They have one mission, infiltrate known North Korean nuclear sites and neutralize them from within. US and South Korean alert aircraft take to the skies in anticipation of a full-blown offensive from the north. On the ground, forces across the DMZ prepare for combat, and an alarm is sounded in Seoul. In case of hostilities, it's expected that North Korea will shell Seoul directly from behind the DMZ and has so many guns that it can deliver a whopping 10,000 rounds of high explosives per minute to the city of 10 million. American supercomputers calculate the trajectory, altitude, and speed of the North Korean warhead and feed that data to the ground-based mid-course defense system. With careful math, the computers calculate a firing solution and green light is given for the launch of interceptors. Four GBIs lift off from their silos in the California desert. The missiles will fly not to where the North Korean nuke is, but rather where it will be when they intercept it with a dumb kinetic warhead that will destroy the enemy nuke through sheer kinetic energy. As they lift into the sky, TPY-2 and sea-based radars are networked together and feed them a steady diet of tracking data. In Guam, Japan, and South Korea, air crews rush to their aircraft in anticipation of full-blown war with North Korea. First up will be F-15s and F-16s to establish air dominance. Normally, stealthy B-2 bombers would slip in behind the air superiority fighters to take out critical air defenses and communications nodes, but the bulk of the B-2 fleet is in Missouri and unprepared for combat. Instead, the Air Force's big stick, the B-52, is prepared for immediate action. These aircraft will require at least an hour to prep, but taking off from bases across the South Pacific will be able to put steel on target within the day. U.S. interceptors are now in space and speeding toward the calculated intercept point with the North Korean warhead. The interceptors have ditched their ascent stages and make only small corrections using chemical thrusters. If the calculated firing solution is bad, they could miss the North Korean warhead by miles. In that case, it'll be up to the Navy's Aegis vessels to down the warhead before it can strike an American city. Updated tracking data reveals the target is likely Los Angeles. The first wave of U.S. Special Operations Forces are given the green light from the American president to take off in their modified Black Hawk helicopters. Their destination is several North Korean nuclear launch facilities believed to be capable of rapid deployment. Other ground attack aircraft based in South Korea are already on their way to their targets, intent on destroying any ability for North Korea to launch a second attack. The U.S. President boards Air Force One. Upon arrival, he asks the United States Congress for a formal declaration of war with North Korea. The North Korean warhead suddenly breaks up into multiple smaller fragments as it ejects a cloud of highly reflective chaff. The metallic confetti is meant to confuse radar systems and make it harder to target the warhead. The warhead is now in eight pieces. Each piece could be a separate warhead or could be a decoy meant to lure missile defense systems away from the real warhead. U.S. ground and space-based radar struggle to pick out the real warhead from possible decoys from within the threat cloud. TPY-2 and sea-based X-band radars are best suited for this task, and it falls on them now to give a good intercept course for America's GBIs. Powerful processors churn through all the available data to sniff out the real threat from amongst the chaff and decoys. If they fail, millions of people will die. Using extremely precise measurements, the dummy warheads are singled out. Because of North Korea's inexperience with MIRV warheads and the use of decoys, the dummy warheads don't quite match the profile of a real warhead as perfectly as it flies through space. With a good intercept solution, the GBIs detach their exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. It will take six minutes for them to reach their target. There's nothing anyone can do now but pray. Unbeknownst to the United States, China has launched its own rapid response forces into North Korea. Elite Chinese troops penetrate North Korean airspace in fast transport helicopters. Their goal is the same as the Americans, seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal before it can be used again, and thus incur the wrath of the American nuclear triad. With both American and Chinese troops headed to the same objectives though, this attack now has the possibility of sparking all-out war between the US and China. American EKVs scream through space at over 4,000 miles per hour. They're just seconds from a successful intercept or a catastrophic failure. The first EKV screams past the intercept point, missing the North Korean weapon by a dozen miles. The second EKV hits nothing. It too misses the North Korean warhead by over three miles. A second after the second EKV, the third strikes its target true, moving at a combined speed of just under 10,000 miles an hour. The impact produces a bright flash in the sky for a brief second. Nuclear detonation requires a precise chain of events, so the impact of the interceptor does not set off the nuclear explosion. Multiple ground stations and ship-based radar assets all confirm the good news. Two misses followed by a direct hit. The threat has been neutralized and the dummy warheads will burn up in the atmosphere. The American president receives the good news aboard Air Force One. He can still see Washington, D.C. out the left side of the aircraft. And despite this threat being over, he will not order a return to the White House. 
The conflict has just begun, and more nuclear attacks are possible at any minute from North Korea. On the ground half a world away, the South Korean and US armies are preparing for what will be the costliest war since World War II, a conflict that will make the original Korean War look like a cap-gun shootout. American warplanes are already en route to the Hermit Kingdom, preparing to drop tens of thousands of pounds of high explosives on suspected nuclear sites, and special forces from both the US and China are racing each other to seize Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal. On the border, the North Korean army is finally making its opening gambit, and over a thousand pieces of artillery begin to rain hell down on the South's defenders. 24 hours before launch, Russia has threatened NATO to cease providing Ukraine with weapons and ammunition for weeks, and at last it's made good on its promise to take military action against any NATO convoys bringing such aid into the country. Just inside the Ukrainian border, a convoy of NATO vehicles is strafed by two Russian Su-25s. The unarmed transports are decimated by gunfire and rockets deployed by the Russian jets. There are no survivors. 23 hours before launch. Verification of the deserted convoy has finally reached the desk of the President of the United States. The convoy was being manned by Polish soldiers who'd help their Ukrainian counterparts unload American C-130s and pack up the much-needed war supplies inside of Polish territory. The shipment of modern weapons was safe as long as it remained outside of Ukraine, but immediately upon crossing the border, Russia declared it a legal military target. Now the President of the US has a very difficult decision to make and he immediately sets up a secure call with the heads of several NATO nations. 19 hours 24 minutes before launch. Earlier in the war, NATO warned Russia that an attack on any of its convoys would constitute an Article 5 response. After a lengthy and heated discussion, the United States, Great Britain, France, Spain, Norway, Germany, and Poland all invoke Article 5 of the alliance. An attack on one is an attack on all. Other NATO members are being brought up to date as their leadership is being informed of the attack. Because the attack was not directly inside NATO territory, some members of the alliance, like Turkey, are having serious reservations. Two hours before launch. The United States, Great Britain, France, Poland, and Germany have all been prepared for the possibility of an attack by Russia, either into Poland or on Polish transports and logistics personnel assisting the Ukrainians. The five states decide to send Russia a strong message, and combat planes kept on alert for such an eventuality have been taking to the skies already for the last half hour. A massive lightning strike force of NATO planes is approaching various Russian military targets in Kaliningrad, Ukraine, and even along Russian borders itself, one hour 18 minutes before launch. NATO planes overwhelm Russian defenses, who are completely unprepared for NATO's massive response. The attack purposely avoids striking Russian troop concentrations and instead lays waste to supply and fuel depots, runways, logistics hubs, and air defense sites. The Russian military giant has proved itself to be clumsy and inept in modern combat. And while a few NATO jets are lost to Russian air defenses, the attack is an overwhelming success. It's hoped that the attack will be enough to deter Russia from further aggression, and the targets were specifically picked in order to avoid large casualties for just this reason. NATO is still hoping to avoid all-out war with Russia, but the attack against a Polish convoy carrying NATO weapons simply cannot be ignored. 19 minutes before launch. Reports of NATO airstrikes have been rolling into Russia's general staff for the last hour and eight minutes. The attack was a complete and total humiliation for Russia, as its much vaunted air defense network was easily suppressed by a massive quantity of highly capable NATO planes. The resulting chaos has produced few military casualties, but opened up serious vulnerability gaps along the Russian border, inviting further incursion of NATO air power. Perhaps worst of all, it's shown that the nation cannot simply match the overpowering technological and doctrinal superiority of NATO's professional militaries. But the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, has been prepared for this. He has only one last card left to play. The only thing keeping NATO from absolutely steamrolling his forces in Ukraine and relegating Russia to a third-rate world power for the next century, nuclear weapons. Putin will send a message of his own. If he fails to, NATO will understand that it has near-complete impunity to attack Russia from the air by exploiting the gaps it created in its first assault along the Russian air defense network. An aide rushes over to President Putin carrying the Cheget, Russia's equivalent to the nuclear football. Much like the American version, the Cheget carries inside of it sealed authorization codes that relay President Putin's orders to his general staff. Putin selects his desired option and transmits the code to the general staff. The signal is uplinked directly to the Kafka's secret communications network that links the senior most Russian leadership together. 
Verified as authentic by the general staff, which had already been gathered beforehand, the signal is then relayed directly to local weapons commanders. This is one of two ways for Russia to launch its nuclear arsenal, the second being its dead hand or perimeter system. This command system allows Russia to launch its nukes even if its entire senior leadership is eliminated in one sudden decapitation strike. Dead Hand was developed in response to US advances in submarine-launched nuclear weapons, which in the 1980s became capable of the precision required for a decapitation strike with only a three-minute warning thanks to the Trident D-5. Using a network of seismic, light, radioactivity, and pressure sensors, Dead Hand can trigger a full-scale retaliatory response even if the entire senior Russian leadership is annihilated in one strike. To get the alert out, a specially modified ICBM is launched which carries a powerful transmitter instead of a nuke and relays a mass launch order across the entire Russian nuclear triad. 13 minutes before launch A single launch order has been relayed to an RS-12M1 Topol-M ICBM unit. The road mobile launcher is harder to destroy in a first strike than ICBMs based on static missile fields, and this particular missile is based far in Russia's east, inside the Kamchatka Peninsula. The missile is already resting in an erected launch configuration, so it only takes a crew a few minutes to authenticate the order and make last-minute preparations for launch. When everything's ready to go, the launch order is given by the senior launch officer as the crew seeks shelter behind a rocky outcropping in case the aging missile experiences a launch failure. Russia's nuclear arsenal is getting into ever-worsening disrepair as the years go by, and the Russian Federation tries to live up to the old glory of the Soviet Union. Launch the cone at the top of the Topol M container is blown off by a series of small explosive charges. Then the massive missile roars to life. The solid fuel rocket shudders as its engine comes online and lifts the 104,000 pound missile into the sky. Even as it's lifting off, the missile's guidance computer begins to connect to Russia's GLONASS satellite network. It's guided by both the inertial guidance and GLONASS satellite uplink, giving it some of the greatest precision of any missiles in the Russian arsenal. Uplink to GLONASS is critical, as the Topol M isn't targeting a major city, which it could achieve with fair but not precision accuracy with only its inertial guidance systems. Instead, the Russian nuclear missile is targeting an American carrier strike group currently in transit south of Japan. Russia aims to teach the US a lesson with the only weapon it can effectively bring to bear against its military superpower. 15 seconds after launch just 15 seconds after launch, a satellite belonging to the United States space-based infrared system detects the massive thermal signature of a large rocket lifting off into the sky. US early warning satellites have been extremely good at detecting missile launches and have even been used to track the launch of much smaller cruise missiles in Russia's conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. The massive Topol-M rocket lights up the early warning satellite's thermal sensor like a blowtorch in the middle of a blizzard. The satellite immediately links up with multiple American Milstar satellites and sends a flash alert to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado, as well as other units across the entire web of the US missile defense. 25 seconds after launch Punching through cloud cover, the eyes of multiple American early warning satellites are picking up the telltale thermal plume of a massive intercontinental ballistic missile. Internally, the satellites compare the thermal plume and other telemetry, such as speed, to positively identify the Russian missile as a Topol M. 30 seconds after launch. The Russian missile is now entering the upper atmosphere in a highly inclined trajectory. To watching satellites, this is indicative of a strike somewhere far closer to Russian shores than the American homeland. The missile is also moving in the wrong direction for a strike in the US, as in that case it should be moving north to fly over the Arctic Circle. 1 minute 15 seconds after launch. The President of the United States has been made aware of the missile launch. America's space-based surveillance network confirms no additional launches. New telemetry also confirms that this missile is not being fired toward the American homeland. There is hope that this is simply a show of strength, an unannounced missile test with a dummy payload. However, the trajectory of the missile leaves Japan and the US base in Guam under threat. 1 minute 45 seconds after launch. An emergency alert is broadcast via Milstar satellites to every combat command and deployed carrier strike group around the world. Ballistic missile defenses are activated in Japan and Guam, as the Japanese Prime Minister is being alerted to the threat. However, the missile's trajectory makes it very unlikely that a strike is incoming toward the Japanese islands. Guam is a suspected target, but so is a transient carrier strike group even now crossing south of Japan toward the South China Sea for routine freedom of navigation exercises. If the strike is against the US carrier, there are only minutes for it to prepare to defend itself against a nuclear attack. 2 minutes 33 seconds after launch. 
The gravity of the threat has been relayed to the transiting American carrier and her escorts. Orders are immediately given for the ships in the formation to begin to spread out and put even more distance than normal between themselves. This is so that a strike against the group may damage most of the ships, but actually only sink a few. Three minutes after launch, jets are ordered to be cleared from the deck of the carrier and rushed below. It's a lengthy process to move a combat aircraft from the deck of a carrier to below decks via the massive aircraft elevators, and unlikely that more than one or two planes could be successfully transferred from a busy deck to below. But all attempts to minimize loss of personnel and all valuable aircraft must be made. Any non-essential crew to the current threat is ordered to brace. Damage control teams are ordered to begin to assemble. Even a glancing blow will likely still cause significant damage to the ship. 3 minutes 22 seconds after launch. The carrier's Aegis-equipped missile cruiser begins preparations for a ballistic missile defense. Its powerful and spy one radar begins sweeping the skies above for the incoming threat, though for now the missile is still far outside of its detection capabilities. 6 minutes 41 seconds after launch. Nearly 7 minutes after launch, the Topolim missile separates the warhead delivery vehicle from the tree stage rocket. This now splits open in a cloud of chaff meant to confuse American radar, and four warheads are jettisoned. Only one of the warheads is real. The other three are cleverly designed decoys meant to lure in interceptors and allow the real warhead to hit its target. The Russian missile has been experiencing some difficulties to date, however. American electronic attacks against the GLONASS system as well as space-based radar satellites have forced the missile to rely largely on inertial guidance as it makes its way to the last known location of the carrier strike group. Given that the carrier now has increased to its classified top speed, estimated to be well over 30 knots, this missile's accuracy is decreasing by the minute. 6 minutes 43 seconds after launch. American space-based satellites blast the cloud of chaff hiding the three decoys and one real warhead with high-powered radar as powerful computers crunch through the data to work to reduce the effect of electronic noise created by the highly reflective chaff. In a few seconds, they have the telltale signature of at least four warheads. Using classified sensor technologies, the American satellites attempt to discern the real warhead from the fakes by measuring very subtle variations in the four warheads. Luckily, the Aegis missile defense cruiser waiting below has numerous interceptors ready to defend the strike group. But time will be of the essence, and the task of intercepting a ballistic missile is still incredibly difficult. In testing under realistic conditions, U.S. missile defenses have had a spotty record to date. Another spot on that record today will mean the death of thousands and the loss of over $15 billion in military hardware. 8 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The warheads have only a short flight time in space due to the proximity of the launcher versus its target, which is adding to the difficulty in interception. Data is of the greatest importance in successful missile interception, and gathering data takes time, time which is officially about to run out. The warheads begin their terminal descent down into the atmosphere. The Aegis cruiser's powerful Spy-1 RAR lights them up from below. On the ship's deck, multiple SM-6 missiles fire off into the pre-dawn sky. A few seconds later, a second volley of missiles lights up, followed a few seconds later by yet a third. The cruiser is taking zero chances and maximizing its odds of successful interception with multiple volleys. If they fail, thousands of sailors will die. 9 minutes 55 seconds after launch. The ship's ANSPG-62 X-band radar illuminates the incoming warheads and helps provide terminal guidance to the SM-6 interceptors. The ability to directly network with both seaborne and space-based sensors allow the Aegis cruiser to cut through most of the electronic noise caused by the massive cloud of chaff released as a countermeasure. There are still doubts about which warhead is the real target, and thus each warhead is assigned multiple interceptors. This increases the chances of targeting the right warhead but reduces the chances of successfully intercepting it. The crew holds its breath as the incoming tracks quickly merge with the ship's defenses. 10 minutes 5 seconds after launch. Closing in at a speed of 1700 meters a second, the first wave of interceptors managed to knock out one of the decoys with a near hit by the SM-6's explosive fragmentation warhead. The warhead suffers severe structural damage from the shrapnel and explosion and tumbles out of control at thousands of miles an hour, destroying itself in the lower atmosphere. 10 minutes 9 seconds after launch. The second volley of SM-6 missiles failed to hit a single target. 10 minutes 13 seconds after launch. The third volley of interceptors knock out a second dummy warhead. 10 minutes 15 seconds after launch. 60 miles below the two incoming warheads, there is no way for the strike group's crews to know if they've knocked out a real warhead or only dummies. Orders have already been given for all to brace for impact and damage control crews are on standby to immediately pounce on any fires or see to fixing hull breaches and flooding. 10 minutes 20 seconds after launch. 
A massive fireball explodes 3,000 meters above the sea somewhere south of Japan. The massive explosion sends out a wave of electromagnetic and thermal radiation that temporarily overpowers satellite sensors. Gradually, the noise fades and these electronic eyes in the sky begin to frantically scan for signs of the strike group. The strike has been off by just over a mile, meaning that the carrier strike group has avoided the most lethal part of the nuclear attack. However, a massive pressure wave slams into the strike group and causes moderate structural damage. On the big carrier, most of the planes left on the deck, even those secured by tie-downs, are blown off and into the ocean by the hurricane gale winds smashing into the strike group. With crews ordered below decks, the initial release of radiation is largely harmless to the strike group's personnel. This is helped by the fact that the strike group was just outside the most lethal radius of the nuclear explosion. Despite this, numerous crew are killed across the strike group from the effect of the pressure wave. Several of the ships are flooding, but damage control crews are already on their way to enact repairs. Compartments too damaged for effective flood control are simply sealed off to keep the rest of the ship from also flooding. This dooms several sailors to a drowning death as their comrades make the impossible choice of trapping them inside flooding sections in order to save the ship. The Russian nuclear strike has effectively rendered an entire strike group combat ineffective, as the ships must now limp to the nearest friendly port for immediate repairs. Decontamination must also be undertaken even before the ships arrive at port, and damage to the flight deck of the carrier repaired to make air operations impossible. However, things could have been far worse if Russia had used more than one missile, as they would in a serious attempt at sinking an American carrier and her accompanying escorts. The fact that Russian nuclear command and control systems as well as their space surveillance and guidance and even the missiles themselves are in great disrepair helped limit possible damage as well. Russian guidance networks such as GLONASS are very vulnerable to disruption, making Russian weapons far from precise. Despite only suffering moderate damage, however, Russia has just launched a nuclear weapon against the armed forces of the United States of America. A full NATO Article 5 response is now inevitable, as is a state of war against a greatly outmatched Russian Federation. Faced with the certainty of losing a war against superior NATO forces, President Vladimir Putin must now contemplate expanding the use of nuclear weapons to defend his hold on power inside the Kremlin and fend off NATO attacks. Yet, in the American White House, the President of the United States is now even reviewing options for a similar attack against a Russian military facility. The world stands on the brink of full-scale nuclear war in what might be the greatest and final conflict of the human race. One week before a U.S. nuclear launch, the United States has been closely monitoring Russian movements in Ukraine. Recently, some unsettling images have been brought to light. Satellite imagery reveals nuclear weapons being moved to airfields just across the border in Russia. Mobile launchers also appear to be on the move. The U.S. military intelligence officers scour the data to make sure what they're seeing is accurate. Several MAZ-7917 transporter erector launchers carry RT-2PM Topol ballistic missiles dangerously close to European borders. It looks as if several of the nuclear missiles are positioned to attack the front lines of the Ukrainian conflict. Others have been moved to the far reaches of Russia's eastern territories. This is unsettling for the United States and its NATO allies, as Vladimir Putin is not known for his level-headedness. As his forces suffer defeat after defeat in Ukraine, he might be willing to take drastic measures. The President of the United States is informed of the deployment of nuclear missiles across Russia. He ponders what might be going through Putin's head, but quickly realizes it's a rabbit hole he doesn't wish to go down. Instead, the President of the United States orders several Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines to deploy closer to Russian shores. If a nuclear response by the United States is needed, these submarines will play a vital role in quickly striking key targets before Russia has time to launch a full-scale nuclear attack. The nation's defense network is put on high alert, as intelligence officers try to gather as much intel as possible to provide the President the opportunity to make the most informed decision. B-2A Spirit stealth bombers take off from Whiteman Air Force Base to fly alert patrols near the Russian mainland. They're loaded with GBU-57AB Massive Ordnance Penetrator bombs in case things go sideways and the U.S. needs to take out Russian high-priority targets hidden deep within protective bunkers. A few B-2s are equipped with B-83 nuclear bombs, however, these aircraft will remain grounded until further notice. These nukes have a maximum yield of 1.2 megatons, making them some of the most powerful nukes in the U.S. arsenal. 24 hours before a U.S. nuclear launch Over the past several days, things have escalated. Ukrainian troops have pushed Russian forces all the way back to Crimea. The Chinese Navy has created a blockade around Taiwan, and Kim Jong-un has been spouting nonsense and threats that if the U.S. tries to interfere with their allies' plans, North Korea is mobilizing forces across the DMZ. 
In a matter of days, global security has gone from relatively stable, except in Ukraine, to terrifyingly uncertain in multiple parts of the world. The President of the United States doesn't sleep anymore. He keeps a close eye on events unfolding across the Atlantic and in the Pacific. Right now, the best thing that the US and its NATO allies can do is prepare. Everyone was already on high alert, but now the President never lets the nuclear football out of his sight. 47 minutes before a US nuclear launch. A high-ranking general bursts into the Oval Office. The President sits at his desk, staring at the latest images coming in from around the world. Russia, China, and North Korea all seem to be posturing toward taking drastic actions. The President can see by the look on this general's face that this is not going to be good news. Then an emergency alert reaches the President directly from the Pentagon. Russia has launched a nuclear missile. A network of satellites tracks the thermal signature of the Russian nuke. It's heading west toward Europe. The President knows the target is not the United States, as if Russia were to attack the US, their ballistic missiles would fly over the Arctic. However, until more data comes in, the exact location of where the nuke is headed is unknown. The President picks up the red phone on his desk and gets the Secretary of Defense on the other line. It's agreed that everyone should meet in the Situation Room to plan out what the next steps will be. 35 minutes before a US nuclear launch, the Russian missile separates in the atmosphere and now four warheads all fall toward the city of Kyiv. Three of the warheads are decoys, but one contains a nuke that could decimate the entire capital of Ukraine. Every NASAMS and anti-air system in Ukraine fires simultaneously. They try desperately to destroy the warheads before the nuke detonates. Most of these systems were designed to take out aircraft, but desperate times call for desperate measures. The world holds its breath, and the seconds tick by. One of the anti-air missiles gets a lucky hit. There's an explosion high up in the atmosphere. It's not clear how many of the warheads were destroyed or if the real nuclear device was the one that was hit. The people of Kyiv take shelter, preparing for the worst. The President of the United States sits in the Situation Room with his generals, praying that this is all just a nightmare he'll wake from. 34 minutes before a US nuclear launch, the Russian nuclear warhead detonates over the city of Kyiv. In an instant, millions of lives are lost. The capital of Ukraine is reduced to a smoldering crater surrounded by irradiated ruins. 33 minutes before a US nuclear launch. Sir, what are your orders? The Secretary of Defense asks the President. His eyes are still fixed on the screen, showing a mushroom cloud rising over what was once Kyiv. Sir, the Secretary of Defense screams. The President closes his eyes and shakes his head. We cannot let him get away with this, the President whispers. Give me the leaders of NATO on the phone. We need everyone on the same page before what happens next. 15 minutes before a US nuclear launch. The President of the United States ends the call between the leaders of NATO. He looks around the Situation Room at his military advisors. The conversation was brief. Everyone agreed that Russia's actions cannot stand without consequences. There needs to be some form of retaliation by NATO. It's clear that Putin has lost his mind. After the nuclear attack, China almost immediately pulled its ships and other forces back to the mainland in an attempt to de-escalate the conflict in East Asia. Even they can't believe that Vladimir Putin would fire a nuclear missile at Ukraine. China has a strict policy of only using nuclear weapons to defend its own territory. They condemn Russia for escalating the war in Ukraine into a much more dangerous global conflict. The Situation Room is silent. The European countries and NATO have already begun mobilizing their forces. The plan is to hit Putin hard and fast. But the problem is, the mad Russian dictator still has more nuclear weapons, many more. The President of the US has declared that Vladimir Putin must be immediately punished and that NATO needs to send a clear message. The US has taken it upon itself to launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against several key military installations across Russia. These nukes will not target major cities or population areas, but they will cripple Russia's nuclear stores and military infrastructure. I've made my decision, the President says. Bring me the codes. 13 minutes before a US nuclear launch. Everyone turns to look at the man holding the black briefcase in the corner of the Situation Room. For a moment, he doesn't move. He knows the ramifications of delivering the briefcase to the President now that he's made up his mind. But it is his sworn duty. The man takes a step forward and carries the nuclear football to the table. He places it in front of the President of the United States and returns to his post. The President unlatches the clasps of the briefcase. They swing open with a satisfying click. The President then opens the case and pulls out the contents, laying them out on a table in front of him. First, the President opens the Black Book, which contains the retaliatory options available to him. There are all types of scenarios. The President runs his index finger over the table of contents until he lands on the one he's looking for. He flips through the pages and finds the correct one. The room is as quiet as a graveyard. It's as if the air has been sucked out of the chamber. No one moves. The President reads what's written on the page to himself and nods his head. He closes the black book and opens another booklet. 
that contains a list of classified sites and their locations around the globe. It's here that he finds the targets that will be hit when he gives the final order to launch nukes at Russia. The president closes the book and opens a manila folder that contains several pages of authentication codes. He picks up the phone and calls the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. They've been expecting his call. The voice on the other line speaks an authentication code into the receiver to verify that the person on the other line is, in fact, the President of the United States. The President pauses for a moment as he reads the words on the laminated card, known as the Biscuit. These words are known only to the President and confirm his identity. The member of the National Military Command Center listens to the response. It is correct. Next, the President relays the specific code that signifies which type of strike he wants. Now that the President has chosen to launch, there's nothing anyone can do to stop the process. The President of the United States is the only one who can authorize a nuclear launch and is the only one who can cancel it once the process has begun. This makes many people in the Situation Room and around the country nervous, especially if they don't agree with his decision. But there's nothing anyone can do about it now. Five minutes before a U.S. nuclear launch. The codes have been authenticated. The identity of the President has been confirmed. The encrypted instructions on what missiles should be prepared for launch and their targets are sent out to all parties involved. These sealed authentication system codes are received by military personnel around the world. When they come in, safes are opened at each site to retrieve the verification codes to ensure the SAS codes are real. Underground launch control centers that control the Minuteman missile silos in the heart of the country prepare for launch. Air Force generals order B-2 pilots to report to their planes. Deep under the waters of the Pacific Ocean, encrypted communications are sent to the Ohio-class submarines, who ready their nuclear missiles for launch. In each instance, the NMCC orders are authenticated one more time by those who receive them to ensure that the most serious decision that's ever been made is real. The NMCC sends out actual missile launch codes. There is one more failsafe to ensure that every possible opportunity to abort the firing sequence has been given. One minute before a U.S. nuclear launch. The crews at the underground missile silos open a box containing two keys. The commander at the facility holds onto one and gives the other to his second in command. Submarine captains hand off a key to their first mate, who walks over to one of the terminals aboard the submarine and prepares for what comes next. The captain pulls his own key out from the chain around his neck. The B-2s that are en route to their targets have been given the authorization to go weapons free. The two pilots in each cockpit are tasked with ensuring their payload hits the correct target. Ten seconds before a U.S. nuclear launch. There's collective anticipation across every branch of the military at this point. All high-ranking officers know what's about to happen. The U.S. is going to war and it's launching nukes to kick off what will likely be a catastrophic series of events. There's still hope that by destroying most of Russia's nuclear capabilities, an all-out nuclear exchange can be avoided, but this can't be confirmed with 100% accuracy. The seconds tick down. Five seconds before a U.S. nuclear launch. Each launch requires that both keys are turned within milliseconds of each other. This ensures that no single person is responsible for launching the nukes and adds another layer of protection against unintentionally starting a nuclear war. One second before a U.S. nuclear launch. The keys turn in their slots. The launch of the United States' nuclear arsenal is initiated. The nuclear triad is the backbone of America's national security. The triad consists of land, air, and sea nuclear launch capabilities, and the President's decision requires that all three branches fire their missiles at Russia. One second after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched. The engines on 100 Minuteman III missiles roar to life in their underground silos. These ballistic missiles are located in Colorado, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Wyoming. The ground shakes as the silo doors open, and the Minuteman missiles roar into the sky. These ICBMs will fly over the Arctic to hit their targets on the other side of the world. The soldiers working in the underground launch control centers ask for forgiveness as they listen to the nukes take flight. The commanders at each facility are still on the phone with the President of the United States and the National Military Command Center. They update them on the progress as the missiles rise higher and higher into the atmosphere. Airborne missile combat crews monitor the ICBMs once they enter the upper atmosphere to ensure they're still on target. The Minuteman III rockets have a range of over 6,000 miles. They accelerate toward their top speed of 15,000 miles per hour, which is around Mach 23. Each missile weighs just under 80,000 pounds, which is a lot of weight to launch 700 miles above the Earth's surface. The rockets use three solid propellant motors to get the job done. Seven Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines rise close to the surface just off the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is only half of the Ohio-class subs that the U.S. has at its disposal, but for the current mission, it's all that's needed. The way the submarines were designed makes them almost impossible for the enemy to locate until they surface, and at that point it's too late. 
Each submarine can carry 20 ballistic missiles with independently targeted warheads. This means that each one of the warheads can be assigned a different target. This will make it incredibly hard for Russia to intercept them all or launch effective countermeasures. It's almost inevitable that at least some of the missiles will hit their targets. The Trident II D-5 missiles erupt out of their submarine silos and accelerate into the air. As soon as the missiles have been launched, the silo doors are closed, and the submarine descends back into the depths of the ocean where it'll hide from any enemy ships trying to locate it. The submarines stealthily make their way back to their respective naval bases to be resupplied for their next mission. There's no rush at this point, as the Ohio-class subs typically spend 77 days at sea before returning for routine maintenance. However, if they needed to, the subs could stay underwater for much longer, as they're nuclear-powered and don't need to surface to replenish air. Instead, they use electrolysis to break apart H2O molecules and generate oxygen for the crew. The B-2 bombers are still traveling toward their objectives. Their timing has been precisely planned out so they drop their bombs as soon as the first nuclear missiles hit their targets. The key to the president's plan is that the nukes strike Russia almost simultaneously, five minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched. NATO forces have launched a series of aerial and ground attacks into Russian territory. Their main objective is to serve as a decoy for what's to come. Bombers and fighter jets hit key Russian radar stations that survey the northern edges of Russian territory and the skies over the Arctic. This is done to prevent early detection of the incoming ballistic missiles arcing over the North Pole of the planet. Ground forces speed toward Moscow in an attempt to force Putin's attention on the invasion instead of the strategic nuclear strikes that the US just launched. It's a race against time for NATO forces. They need to cause as much damage and mayhem as possible to distract the mad dictator of Russia from launching his own nukes. Long-range missiles target key communication hubs between Moscow and the rest of the country. The more disruptive NATO forces can be, the better the chances the U.S. nukes have at hitting their targets without being intercepted. 15 minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched, the Trident II D-5 missiles descend toward their targets. Simultaneously, the B-2s drop their nuclear bombs. These stealth aircraft are supplemented by a handful of B-21 Raiders with upgraded tech and longer ranges. The Russians have no idea that these aircraft have entered their airspace. They claimed that their newest forms of radar could detect even stealth bombers, but this, like so much of Russia's military posturing, is just a fabrication. The pilots sight their targets using a combination of infrared sensors, satellite telemetry, and high-tech radar. They've already been given the all-clear to drop their nukes, since they must maintain radio silence while in Russian airspace to keep from being detected. Each B-2 drops 16 2,400-pound B-83 nuclear bombs. They use sophisticated guidance systems to ensure that the nukes hit their targets. In an instant, dozens of nuclear missiles and bombs detonate above key Russian military installations. The distraction by NATO forces seems to have worked. The already weakened Russian military is so understaffed due to the war in Ukraine that they just didn't have the personnel to effectively monitor the NATO attacks and the incoming U.S. nuclear warheads. However, it's now clear what the strategy is. Putin screams at his generals to launch any Russian nukes that remain. At that very moment, a B-61 thermonuclear gravity bomb penetrates the ground near where Vladimir Putin is hunkered down in a bunker. The nuke detonates and instantly wipes out the Russian president and his closest generals. This will cause a breakdown in the chain of command and should deter Russia from launching its own nukes. Luckily, the classified information the president of the United States had included detailed instructions on where the first nuclear warheads needed to strike to deactivate the Russian dead hand contingency. The automated system is supposed to kick in if the Russian leadership is ever killed in a nuclear attack. Dead Hand uses information and sensors to determine if an all-out retaliatory strike should be launched if Russian leadership has been compromised. However, the system was from the Soviet era, and like many of the military systems that carried over from the time period, it was not properly maintained. A few well-placed nuclear strikes have completely disabled the Dead Hand system and have kept Russian protocols from instantly launching every remaining nuke they had at U.S. and NATO targets. 30 minutes after U.S. nuclear missiles are launched, the Minuteman III ICBMs are about to strike their targets. The warheads are descending toward the Earth at top speed. The remaining leaders of the Russian military use the A-135 system, which once consisted of 68 nuclear-armed interceptors and phased-array radar stations to track and destroy incoming missiles. But the first strike by the U.S. has already decimated countless bases and assets, rendering their defensive network almost completely inoperable. The Russian Unified Air Defense System is still relaying information. The problem is, the military personnel required to effectively launch nuclear countermeasures have been decimated by the initial attack and by the war in Ukraine. However, two of the six Voronezh early warning radar installations still remain, 
and are connected to the S-400 and S-500 anti-missile systems. The S-400 is designed to intercept aircraft and ballistic missiles with a range of up to 250 miles. The upgraded version of these missiles has an active radar to help them track incoming targets. The Russian military launches several S-400 at the incoming Minuteman 3s. Several hit their targets and detonate. Russia also has next-generation S-500s, but with a shortage of semiconductors and materials due to sanctions from the war in Ukraine, the upgrading of their missile defense systems has yet to be completed. The Minuteman 3 nukes hit their marks. Almost all of the major Russian targets that the President of the U.S. ordered to be destroyed are now either vaporized or consumed by fire. The Russian landscape is covered in radiation. Its military is decimated. Key Russian government and military leaders are no more. The mission was a success, but at what cost? A U.S. nuclear launch is something that the world hopes will never happen again. Now watch What If North Korea Launched a Nuclear Bomb Minute by Minute, or check out This Is How You Actually Survive a Nuclear Attack.